Yes, go ahead. Okay, great. All right, so let's jump right into it. Let's talk about uh, pumps and motors. Um, as uh, many of you um, maybe already have achieved um, several licensor levels, but um, maybe you have some up and coming individuals or maybe you're a system manager um, or a director of some sort. Um, this is still a topic that is, that is uh, very, very reoccurring in our industry. So when we start talking about controllable costs within a utility, we really kind of come to the conclusion that there are a couple places that are, are, are low hanging fruits or, or places that we start. Um, one of them is, involves pumps and motors. That's our electrical consumption. Um, that's where you would get into a lot of our load prioritization plans um, and, and such. But um, the other one obviously being uh, potentially chemical supply. So those are two of our major um, costers uh, when we start looking at utility overhead. Um, but I thought it'd be prudent to uh, start out and let's not take for granted and go right into the deep end of the pool on this. Let's start very, very basic with uh, our understanding of pumps and motors. Um, so our first concept that I'd like to discuss is that whenever we start discussing these systems, that a pump and a motor are not the same piece of equipment, right? Um, the motor is going to be taking electrical energy and it's going to be converting that electrical energy uh, into mechanical energy, right? So whenever we do that conversion of energy, um, there's always a loss involved. Uh, in our industry, anytime you convert energy, there tends to be, uh, that loss tends to be expressed as heat. Um, and this is no different. So we're taking electrical energy across the motor and we are converting that to mechanical energy to the shaft, okay? And then we're imparting that remainder of that energy left to the shaft uh, to the impeller uh, inside the pump, right? And then uh, doing a conversion there from mechanical energy to hydraulic energy and building pressure head. Um, and so whenever we start talking about these systems, there's area for efficiency across uh, either um, item. Uh, these systems tend to be one of our largest assets uh, because they um, are, um, uh, you know, usually very uh, costly uh, to maintain and um, costly to purchase. So um, anyway, so let's dive right in here and let's start out very basically and, um, and start getting uh, some of the common lingo on um, some of these pumps and motor systems. Okay, so very, very basic. What is a pump? Okay, so on each of those pieces of equipment, the motor versus which is the prime mover, right, and the pump, we have different things that we can look at on those to find out uh, different performance values. One of the tracked performance values uh, upon a pump would be uh, looking at that device and it's going to um, uh, take and display this energy transversion or uh, the center energy transition, I uh, should say, to, uh, as pressure and flow. Okay, so those are two things within a pump that give us a lot of clues about its current performance. Um, and when we say pressure, we're measuring pressure maybe at multiple points, but uh, nonetheless, we're looking at a pressure reading uh, along with a flow reading. Now, a quick note on pressure um, is uh, it becomes more and more complex uh, when we start talking about pump placement. And we'll revisit that here in a moment because where we actually put that pump in relation to the fluid that we're pumping is definitely going to matter. Um, and so we're gonna discuss that and uh, as we move a little bit further on, but we'll put a pin in it for now and just say that pressure and flow, right? So as we track our flow rates, if we see flow rate changing, uh, it may be an early indicator that something's going on, um, likewise with pressure, okay? Okay, so when we start actually looking at pumps themselves, there is a very, very large amount of different types of pumps, okay? Uh, and so thus it necessitated the need to create basically a, a family tree. I'm very, very happy of this, okay? So um, right off the bat, we, we classify all pumps within two categories, okay? So we have our dynamic pumps, uh, that, that camp up at the top here, this is where 
um, the majority of our large flow volumes are going to happen, right? Uh, this would be uh, potentially when we pump out of a clear well um, out into our system, um, they're going to um, be living in this dynamic pump camp. Okay, so a lot of our large flow volumes live there. Uh, within the dynamic uh, pump camp, we have several different subclassifications. Uh, we have a in suction centrifugal um, pump, a very, very pump common pump utilized in um, clean drinking water and wastewater alike. Um, generally, we'll have a, a, a either a semi-open or open impeller. And we'll get to talking about those uh, just briefly as we move on, because identification of components can be very crucial. Uh, this in particular in section centrifugal pump uh, actually has the motor over here and the pumping unit over here. And what is unique is this is an application that we would call a open coupled pump, okay? Uh, you see these very oftentimes if you uh, have a, a surface water withdraw potentially, but even more common than that, you see them in wastewater applications. The idea of having that coupler in place is it, it, it creates a um, almost like a um, uh, some type of a, a, a cotter pin or, or a point of failure that protects the motor. It does several other things, and we'll kind of maybe pick on that one a little bit as we move on. We'll see how, how we go. But um, definitely uh, a consideration. And we'll, I'll, we'll show you on the next slide what we consider some of our closed coupled options where there is no coupler in play. Um, but that's our in-section centrifugal. This one over here, our split case, very, very common pumps um, uh, when we start talking about clean water, right? Um, they do not like solids. Uh, high solids for them um, is, is not good. And it has to do with the type of impeller in them. Okay. And we'll get to that identification point here in a minute. But uh, split case pumps, definitely, definitely, definitely very common, especially in drinking water. Uh, uh, very efficient pumps. Um, but uh, they do have their own. Um, wearables and their own things within them that we would need to look at from a maintenance perspective. Um, that is the pump that is most commonly used on fire trucks, if you're wondering. So um, split case pumps. Um, moving over, we get into our vertical turbine pumps. This is a stage pump. The split case could be a stage pump as well, but more common than not, our vertical turbine pumps are, are going to be a stage pump. Whenever we talk about a multi-stage pump, it means we have multiple impellers or think of it like multiple pumps in a row, okay? Um, they are uh, definitely a very, very common pump, highly efficient for what they do, um, and a very, very common pump in, um, in our industry for sure. Um, a key note or something to note about this vertical turbine pump is, um, of course, our motor is up here and our pump is down here, it's submersed, okay? Um, that offers a few key advantages, um, but one of the main concepts that we like to tease out is the, uh, what would happen if we added more stages to the vertical turbine pump, right? Um, meaning this one just happens to have two stages there, or two impellers, but what if we should add a third? What would that change in relation to the pump? Okay, well, there's a lot of other technical things that could change about the pump, but one of the key principles that we like to remember about the vertical turbine pump is the more stages we have within that pump, the more, uh, the greater its ability to generate pressure and head, um, but it is not necessarily, or it is not, not necessarily, it is not adding any extra flow. Okay, so the, the flow is determined by the overall size or circumference of, of the pump inlet. Right, so adding more pumps in a row is only going to increase our pressure, not our flow rate. All right, so that's a key principle that we like to remember about those. Um, uh, there's a lot of other hydraulic things that go into that, but that's that's a pretty basic thing. All of these special effects pumps, we're going to kind of set those aside for right now. Um, uh, they can get rather complex based on their application and where we may see them, um, but they are they are dwarfed in comparison to uh, the other three categories of how far um, of uh, how often you see them and, and how numerous they are. 
So we'll kind of set those aside for right now. Um, you tend to see those in um, certain geothermal applications or boiler systems, what have you. Um, okay, so that handles our dynamic pumps, right? And then we move down here to our displacement pumps. Okay, so our displacement pumps, what we want to think about for them is they specialize in anything with high solids, okay? Um, they operate much like a syringe. Um, what goes in must come out, okay? So right off the bat, we have a best practice on these. Um, these displacement pumps, um, again, functioning like a syringe, you never want to shut the outlet valve of a displacement pump when it's in operation because that fluid will go somewhere, right? Um, so when we classify our displacement pumps, uh, one of the first things we like to do is um, we classify them by the motion used to impart energy to the fluid, okay? So what type of motion is being utilized to actually um, uh, put energy into that fluid? Okay, so over here we have our rotary, right, which would be a rotational force uh, that is utilized. Um, that would be our multiple gear and lobe, a progressive cavity. Um, we see our progressive cavity pumps used on solids handling many times. If you have um, uh, some of the plate and frame presses for solids or, or some of the dewatering that we may see, uh, we see progressive cavity utilized. Uh, peristaltic, uh, definitely, or, or hose pump. You may hear them called a tube pump. Um, it's the type of pump that's utilized in our auto samplers. And it has a, it'll have a tube and, and it'll have rollers rolling around. Very, very common pump for chemical injection as well. Um, and right next door to it is our diaphragm pump, right? Again, a very, very common pump for chemical injection. Uh, some of the brands that you may have seen out there would be like LMI, some, some like that, um, diaphragm pump, and then our piston pump, okay? Um, uh, piston pump as well is, is just exactly what you would think. It's a large piston running in a cylinder, much like a motor would. Um, again, specializing in high solids content. Again, we tend to see the piston pump most often utilized um, in solids handling. Um, not to say that there aren't piston pumps utilized or even small progressive cavity pumps utilized in chemical injection, um, but generally speaking, they're not nearly as popular as some of the peristaltic and uh, diaphragm options when it comes to chemical injection. Um, so uh, a key principle that I like to tease out there, especially for those progressing their licensor, is um, that all of these displacement pumps um, specialize in dosing precise volumes as well. Okay, um, that becomes very important, especially when we start talking about chemical injection. So um, when we start talking about what pump is best for chemical injection, um, sometimes when we, uh, you know, when we would approach that type of a question, um, if we were trying to look at it from an examination standpoint or whatever, we may think, oh, well, I'm familiar with what I use for chemical injection, therefore I'm gonna choose that option. For instance, you may say a peristaltic pump or you may say a diaphragm pump. What I always encourage um, everybody to do is when you start thinking about those, start thinking in the greater category, okay? So a diaphragm pump is just a subclassification of a displacement pump. It's a style, it's a type, right? So the best pump for administering chemicals or chemical dosing would be any pump within the displacement pump category. Um, there's a few other key differences on these and we're gonna move through, we're gonna talk about some of those key differences between the two categories as we move along here. Um, as promised, there's two pumps that we didn't discuss within the dynamic camp, but are very, very common. Uh, these are going to be our end suction submersible pumps. Um, uh, these two pumps on the screen here happen to be um, closed coupled, right? Uh, they're, they're, you can't see the shaft uh, that goes from the motor to the pump, okay? Um, and this one over here, uh, most commonly might be used in a uh, wastewater lift station type application, um, whereas this style may be more common within our um, clean drinking water applications as well. Uh, but we do also have an end suction centrifugal style pump that, that may in fact be closed coupled. 
Um, one of the things that we start that we start thinking about when we start talking about um, you know closed coupled versus open coupled, where you can see on the split case, clearly they're not permanently affixed to each other. Okay, and that starts talking about the um, pro and con. Okay, so generally speaking, when we are talking about closed coupled pumps, um, we have a much smaller footprint that they're put in, um, which is extremely helpful, especially if we're tight on space. Um, but there's, it's not without our um, need for attention. Um, and there is potential consequences. So on a pump, you're going to have one side of it that's going to have obviously the liquid that you're pumping on. And then you're going to have your motor on the other side. Now, this may sound very basic, but um, we definitely do not want that water to get into our electrical motor. It could cause a motor failure. So this can be kind of a, you know, a uh, pro-con of this type of pump. A pro is, is it's small footprint. Um, another pro is because there's no coupler in place. We um, generally do not have an issue with a, a misalignment. Uh, within between the uh, pump and motor, but the consequence may be is what are we using to make the seal between the wet and the dry side? Okay, and on these closed coupled pumps, we utilize a mechanical style seal, um, and we'll talk a little bit about that. But the mechanical style seal versus um, some of our other options like a packed pump. Um, but when we start looking at this from a um, student development standpoint, one of the knowledge based questions that we may consider would be um, just teasing out some of those consequences. If we should have a seal failure on a closed coupled pump, we in all likelihood may experience a motor failure as well. So that is one of the um, pro cons of that design is that um, if we should in fact uh, have water up into the motor, that's going to obviously ruin potentially the entire piece of equipment. So um, definitely something we consider when we consider what is the right one for the right job, the right tool for that job. Uh, there's a picture of a submersible. Okay, so back to our displacement pumps. Okay, so here's an example. Uh, some pictures of those uh, two or sm two smaller style pumps that we may use for chemical injection. Um, you know, the yellow pump, they've done very, very well for um, branding and, and name recognition. That would be an, uh, potentially an LMI pump. Um, and that's just the brand name over here on the uh, hose or tube style pump. Lots of options there. Uh, Stinner, Watson Marlowe, uh, lots of different brand options when it comes to these two, but these two tend to be our favorite for chemical injection. Now, some, something that we, con that, we, uh, that we discuss when we start discussing the um, you know, right application for either of these pumps, because both can perform very, very well um, if utilized properly. Um, one of them is a understanding of how this diaphragm pump works. Um, it's a reciprocating pump, so it is using that reciprocal motion um, to uh, cause the fluid to pump. Uh, so there will be a flexible diaphragm um, right there. And then what happens is you'll have a rod tied to that diaphragm and it will pull back. And as it pulls back, it will draw fluid into that space it creates. Um, and then through the utilization of two check valves, one on top and one bottom, uh, it will allow the fluid to be drawn in and then pushed out, right? Um, so this pump has two generally, uh, depending upon which one you have, but almost always has uh, two um, controls on them, right? Um, the two controls that we see on these would be speed, how fast it moves, and stroke. And stroke has to do with how far are we going to pull that rod back on the elastomer diaphragm before it goes back to its pump cycle. Um, and so speed and stroke are the two um, controls you tend to see on those. So one of the knowledge things that we talk about when we talk about operation of these and best practice of these would be um, if you were to add needing to add more chemical, well, which knob would be the most appropriate to turn? Okay, and this does go back to a little bit of a logical query on this one. And that is, uh, we always like to say you would turn the speed up. Now, 
you very well could turn the stroke up and add more chemical, but it could be problematic. And here's why uh, we like to see you turn the speed up on these versus the stroke when it's, when it's small chemical changes. It has to do with the correlation and relationship to a peristaltic pump, okay? Um, I have seen peristaltic pumps that have a hose that is big enough to actually put a softball through it. Um, many times on the larger ones of these, when we're using them for lime or any other um, slurry, uh, carbon, um, well, many, many times the larger these pumps see a oil bath involved uh, where the um, rollers contact the tubing to help lubricate and get more life expectancy. Um, but what, going back to that concept, if you wanted to add more chemical um, on a peristaltic pump, you would simply turn up the speed. And the reason being is because if we wanted to add more stroke, you in most of those applications can, but that would involve changing your tube size, right? And that again becomes problematic. Um, so uh, from a knowledge base and a needs to know criterion for um, examination, we would always say, let's, let's add more speed before we adjust the stroke. Um, now, from an examination standpoint, we would also consider it a needs to know concept of where are we in this pump's performance le level um, as far as its capacity. And so what is our stroke relationship to our speed? Okay, so from an exam standpoint, we like to see you at um, where your speed is at 50% at ideal, right? And what does that mean? That means that your stroke is set in a, in a way where during most regular flows, your speed's at 50% or halfway. The logic there is then that gives you the maximum ability to adjust the pump down for slowing your injection rate or speed it up, right? It gives you the most amount of adjustment. Now, if we're talking outside of a you know, knowledge base um, system, we could add a few other caveats to that for real world. So let's talk about practical, where it may affect you in your plants today. Um, if we're in a drinking water plant, uh, most generally we like to um, leverage the most amount of control over our treatment process. One of the main things we like to control is our rate of flow. So if the rate of flow or the flow rate that we're pulling through our plant is highly consistent, meaning we, we run at a certain flow rate, that could be um, whatever your plants run at. You, let's just make up a number. Let's say you run at 350 gallons per minute out of your plant. And that is what it's you know, designed to run at. That's what it's gonna run at. Um, and we try to maintain that. If we're maintaining a highly controlled level of flow, then what we're many times able to do is actually alter how we operate our chemical injection, okay? So from a functional standpoint um, and for a life expectancy standpoint, if we are controlling how much um, water's coming in or how much water fluid we're dosing, our goal then would be to run the largest possible stroke and the uh, lowest possible speed. The idea there is we're gonna put more in each time that pump pumps, but we're gonna do it less often. And the idea there is because we're using uh, mechanical things upon elastomer or flexible things, we wanna get the most amount of life expectancy out of our tubes before they fail or our diaphragms as well, right? Um, two other things that we talk about, and we're gonna um, dive a little bit deeper into the diaphragm pump here in a minute, is um, making sure as one of our PM things um, that we're taking the checks and cleaning them on the top and bottom. Now, anytime we're fooling around any type of a chemical or handling any type of chemical, we need to make sure that we understand the risks involved and we have our proper uh, personal protective equipment or PPE on. Um, don't ever neglect that um, because uh, we've even had an instance this last week here in Georgia where an operator had chemicals splashed uh, in their face uh, because they did not don down in the proper PPE before they handled one of these. Um, all right, so um, moving right along, that's a couple things on chemical injection, especially concerning these displacement pumps. One of the other things that occurs to us is how do we make sure, right, we're actually you know, injecting the proper amount of chemical. Is our pump working properly? 
So one of the difficulties many times on these chemical pumps is because we're pumping fluid with, you know, high solids is um, it's rather problematic to put some type of a flow meter on them. You know, um, they're small volumes. They usually have high solids that kind of wants to build up, gunk up, can be a problem. So um, one of the key principles that we'll practice is a term called doing performing a drawdown. Okay. Um, and what that is, is uh, on a smaller, say on a chemical injection pump, this also does work on um, larger uh, pumps, uh, displacement pumps in particular. This will also work on larger ones as well. It's just the scale gets much, much bigger. Okay. Because you may be pumping out of a, um, you know, a clarifier or, or a larger vessel versus a, a column. If you are doing this on a chemical injection pump, and maybe you don't have a calibration column, right? One of these right here. Uh, what you can do is you can utilize a graduated cylinder, okay? So what we're going to try to figure out is um, we're going to cause the pump to draw out of a known vessel, right? And we're then going to be able to do a mathematical calculation to figure out, are we injecting the proper amount or what we think we are injecting or what it should be injecting at? So we'll know based on our historical data and performance values, uh, what this pump should operate at. And we always pump uh, against our normal system pressure, right? Because pressure and flow do have a, a correlative effect. Um, but we always perform this on the suction side. So many times you'll see this, uh, this operation performed where you fill this, and many times these will be pre-installed where they're just there. Fill this up and then valve off your main chemical tank and then um, pump out of that and then you time it. So now you have the, uh, an amount of chemical over time and then you can come up with your inje injection rate. It takes a little bit of math, but um, very, very helpful. Um, a couple of the other um, just real life tips I would give you about chemical injection in, in general, um, and this is based just on my uh, personal experience, is, um, uh, is uh, several things, but one of them in particular is uh, in lieu of a calibration column, another effective manner to do um, continual monitoring in your plant may be to get two day tanks, okay? so. Um, if we have two day tanks and two pumps pumping and a day tank will just hold an amount of chemical you would use for the day. Um, and both of those have the ability to see the tank level. Um, what that can do for us is we can then immediately see if one of our pumps is operating different than the other. Um, that can give us some real quick feedback uh, that we may have a, a potential issue developing in one of our pumps. Um, of course, we'd verify that with a calibration column test. Um, okay, so here's a cutaway of what a diaphragm pump actually looks like, okay? So you do have a, um, a, a rod attached to an elastomer diaphragm, right? And as that is pulled back, you're going to pull fluid up past this check, and then on its return stroke, it's going to cause this check to fall, and then this uh, check to lift, and it's going to pump fluid out. Right, so there you have it, the speed and the stroke. Uh, here's another uh, example of what it would look like on its suction versus discharge phase. And again, working with that elastomer diaphragm. And I know I've said it once, but I'll say it twice. Uh, this is usually the main um, part of our PM that we would need to perform on this specific style pump is making sure we clean those checks. Um, it is a little bit of a weakness of this pump uh, when we start talking pro-con is that um, if on the very unlikely, but it can happen off chance that both of these checks get hung open, we may back siphon through this pump. And, and that is a little bit of a um, pro-con that that's part of why we need to make sure we keep those uh, well-maintained. Here's another uh, diagram of uh, what, it, uh, uh, what it would look like. And there's two other checks that are often forgotten about that I like to bring up. One is at the injection point of that chemical. Uh, and there's generally another check there. Uh, that is one that when we clean the other two, we'd wanna clean that one. And then the last one is actually many times contained in the foot valve. Uh, foot valve is, is just a fancy name for a check valve. 
Um, and that can be another one that we would clean as well, right, uh, on this specific pump. So uh, all in all, many times we'll have uh, four um, checks that we're cleaning too. Um, some, some may, some may not, but if you have this style many times, that's what we're dealing with. Uh, there's a picture of what one might look like. Um, the only, um, I guess, critique that we may have of this is um, we need to make sure we're aware of our containment, okay? So um, if we should have, and, and we don't have a good visual here in this image to tell us, but if we should have a uh, failure of these, one of these pumps and we do develop a leak, we would want to be uh, aware of where that chemical is going to go. Um, because uh, we don't want to cause a spill within our own facilities and uh, co further cause an issue. Again, peristaltic pumps uses a roller me mechanism with a flexible tube. This is that other one we were talking about. And then tubes obviously have to be uh, replaced periodically just as the diaphragms would in a diaphragm pump. Here's what one of those look like. You have uh, rollers rolling and creating that um, that, that pump tube, pinching it along and forcing the chemical around. One of the advantages of this style, peristaltic style pump, where you've eliminated many of your checks is that um, based on its very design, it eliminates the possibility of um, back siphoning or pulling fluid back into it uh, because you always have a roller in contact, right? So that is one of the advantages of this style. Okay. so. We talk about these, we talk about four key differences to kind of summation between these two categories. And again, we got to make sure we're using the right pump for the right application. So first one, uh, dynamic pumps, energy is added continuously, right? We turn the pump on and it is running, okay? Displacement pumps, energy is added periodically, right? Whenever that rotation or that motion is, it, it happens, but it always is done to a set volume, okay? Dynamic pumps, can in fact operate uh, briefly, emphasize briefly, against a closed uh, discharge valve. Um, we actually will utilize that at times, uh, uh, having a closed discharge valve to help build, uh, get the pump up onto head before we slowly open it to the system to prevent a water hammer. Um, whereas on our displacement pumps, uh, you, you do not want, when they're in operation, you do not want to um, close the valve that will be that fluid will be going somewhere. Again, think of them like a syringe. Um, dynamic pumps are used to produce uh, continuous flows, right? The flow is always going. And again, displacement pumps, precise flow. Um, on dynamic pumps, uh, flow is inversely proportional to head. Now, what that means is, is as the pressure that we're pumping against goes up, for instance, uh, if we're pumping into a water tower or a water tank, as that tank gets it full, right, and we're starting to have more and more pressure that that pump is pushing against. So as the pressure goes up, our flow rate will naturally go down, right? Because it's, it's working against that head. Um, this phenomenon is many times kind of hidden from a lot of us operators uh, with the advent of a uh, variable frequency drive. Um, think of a dimmer switch on a light bulb. It's much more complex than that, but what we can do is actually slower speed these up and that can obviously control the rate of flow. So even as the um, pressure that it's pumping against goes up, it may just ramp the pump up. But without that is some other thing intervening, they do have an inverse relationship. Um, displacement pumps flow is independent of head. As long as you are within the operating values of that pump, um, it is going to operate. Now I will say this, there is a um, advantage to that diaphragm pump is if you're injecting into um, very high pressure, they tend to work slightly better, the, the diaphragm style. So. Um, and when I say high pressure, um, in excess of 150 PSI would be a high pressure injection. And they tend to work better for that uh, particular application. Okay, so back over to our dynamic pumps now. Let's break those down because those are where a lot of our large flow volumes, very, very common. Let's break down a few of our key components within here. Um, and uh, this will kind of help give us the language of pumps, right? And so we know how to identify what part or what thing. So if you ever have to call for service or for help, um, you'll have the right language to utilize. 
Okay, so first thing we do always is we need to identify the inlet and outlet of a pump. Okay, so on all pumps, fluid is always injected into the impeller eye, okay, or the eye of the impeller, okay. And then it is always, that is always the inlet. So thus, this is the outlet, all right? So what we're actually doing here is the fluid's coming in to the impeller, right? And we're utilizing centrifugal force, okay? Now here's where ma you know pump magic actually starts to happen. Now this impeller is not actually centered within this case. Now this case is, is uh, commonly called a volute case and a volute has to do with a geometric shape kind of like a snail an ever expanding area okay so what we start seeing within this volute case is a is is a is a conversion that, that happens from a, a mechanical energy to a, a, a velocity head or a, or a hydraulic energy and into a pressure head Okay, so we're going to go to the next slide and talk about that. But before we do, we, we don't want to forget we're going to have a shaft involved, right, in that. And we're also going to have to have something to create the seal. In this instance, we're calling that packing, but it very well could be a mechanical seal. We'll talk about that. Okay, so here's what it would look like inside of it. Okay, so one of the first misconceptions or, or things that can happen is um, which direction does this impeller go? Okay. So in, for this impeller with the curved veins, what we're actually doing is bringing the fluid in and throwing it out against the uh, pump wall, okay? So let's, we start out over here, we have electrical energy, we convert that to mechanical energy to the shaft, and then over here to a velocity head and then a pressure head, okay? And just another little tidbit for you, this part of the volute actually does have a little bit of a special name. It's called the cut water. It's what keeps the fluid from just recirculating within the pump. It forces it to leave. Okay, so what we're actually doing is we're actually rotating this in this direction. You see how the curvature is? It almost looks like it's rotating backwards. What we're doing is we're utilizing centrifugal force and forcing that fluid out against this geometric shape. Okay, now we have to go back to that same um, principle, right? And it's the uh, Bernoulli principle, right? Of energy transference, right? So as the velocity or speed of a fluid increases, the pressure exerted by the fluid decreases and vice versa. As we slow the fluid down, we increase the pressure. So what happens is when we are right up here at the top, we are moving at high velocity, right? Which means low pressure. And then as we come around this geometric shape and we're forcing that water out into the shape, what we're actually doing is we're slowing down the velocity and gaining pressure, okay? It's kind of the magic that happens within the pump. Um, and then we discharge out of the pump, okay? Now, uh, a, a key issue that we have within these pumps is they must always be full of water, right? Um, it's a process called priming. Um, if we, if our pump is not properly primed and we have entrained air into this pump, um, it's going to be very unhappy, right? So we're always trying to keep that impeller in direct contact with the fluid, right, at all times and it end up fully submerged in the pumped fluid, okay? Uh, priming has a whole lot of really fancy definitions, but at the end of the day, all it is is we got to make sure we get all the air out and make sure all the water's in. Okay. So that is one of our key principles. Now, where this entire pump lives affects a lot of its performance value, how well it's going to work. Okay. In this instance, we've moved the pump up and above the surface of the fluid. Okay, we call this a suction lift condition because we are putting the inlet suction of that pump above the pumped fluid. Okay, um, so what we actually are utilizing here is um, kind of amazing to think about, but what we utilize when we put this in a suction lift condition is gravity, right? So gravity actually exerts pressure on the top of all the fluid, right? 
and it uh, pushes down on the surface of this fluid and creates a, some positive pressure to help, you know, replace or force the fluid up into the pump. Now, um, this has to do this number of maximum suction lift. Uh, it's actually 33.9 or 33.8. It has to do with the amount of um, pressure at um, sea level, right? So whenever we change our elevation, we alter our pump's performance when we're in suction lift, especially, okay? Because we may not have as much gravitational force pushing down on the surface of the fluid to replenish it as fast. And uh, that's where you get into a really complex term called net positive suction head. Um, and we're not gonna go delve all the way in the weeds on that, but needless to say, if we failed to meet an adequate amount of pressure on the inlet side of this pump, uh, we'll actually induce cavitation into this pump. And cavitation is very damaging to the pump. We actually uh, are boiling the water inside of that pump. Uh, very interesting, uh, but uh, very, very damaging to the pump. Okay, so uh, one of the other key principles that you may um, may want to know would be our total static head, um, and that is always measured to the center line of the pump, right? So we had to have a certain amount of feet to the center line of the pump. Let's pretend and say that that is ten feet, and then from the center line of the pump to the static discharge, let's say that's twenty feet. So if we had ten feet here, twenty feet here, our total static head would then be thirty feet, right? Another one of those key principles that we would need when we're trying to um, make sure we have the right pump selection, okay? Um, there's a lot, so if you look, you look on the formula sheet that a lot of the operators uh, will have to have for sitting for their exam, um, there's several different um, formulas surrounding, uh, mathematical formulas surrounding uh, pumps and motors. Um, so I, I wanted a graphic to kind of show where a lot of those formulas you live on these pieces of equipment. So the first one is uh, the motor horsepower formula that's actually on the formula sheet. And what that's doing is that accounting for that power loss due to the motor in inefficiency, which moves us over to our brake horsepower, the amount of horsepower to the pump. And then we have loss due to pump inefficiency, which leads us to our water horsepower. Okay. And if we were trying to express the total loss across this piece of equipment from the electrical side to the water side, that's called wire to water math. Okay. So um, let's talk about the heart of the pump. We've kind of mentioned it, and that's the impeller. We classify them uh, based on uh, specific speed, size, and style. So one of the most important things that we're going to talk about is the style, right? Um, very, very important to know that so that when we communicate with a pump manufacturer or someone who may be coming to maintenance our pumps, we can tell them uh, the, the pertinent information that they may need to know. So there's three basic types uh, out there. Uh, there's the open, um, the semi-open, and then the closed, all right? A closed impeller will have a... Um, a back plate and a shroud on either side um, instead of just a semi open, which only has a back plate. Um, this closed impeller is specifically utilized within those split case pumps that we were talking about earlier, a very specific style. Okay. Um, again, we've already talked about rotation of the pump. Um, it is plausible to actually cause a pump to rotate the wrong direction. Uh, we tend to see that when it's newly installed. Um, and if you are on a uh, three phase motor um, and you um, reverse two of the phases, uh, you can actually reverse the rotation of the motor. Uh, thus, you would rotate your impeller in the wrong direction. Um, very, very important that we rotate in the correct direction. So there is a term for uh, that. If we have it rotating in the wrong direction, it's called cupping. Uh, you're cupping the fluid instead of slinging the fluid away, right? Um, you'll have some pump pumping, but not nearly within the ideal range, okay? Um, this is another, I put this on here just to uh, kind of show that whenever we send our pumps off for rebuild, this has to do with uh, good data keeping and good record keeping. Um, so this is a rather 
oddly shapen um, impeller. The original impeller was over three times this diameter, okay? Now, what ended up happening is they had severely oversized their pump, right? And it was causing system issues. So they had to have their impeller trimmed. Now, this is uh, drastically decreases the pump's efficiency, um, but was a more common practice uh, before the advent of a lot of our modern machining. So this does lead to a, um, a very key concept on record keeping. If you send your pump off for rebuild, um, they're gonna take in, and without any other information from you, they're going to rebuild that pump based on the manufacturer's recommendation, right? Or whatever the original manufacturer spec was. The issue for that is, is if you do actually have a trimmed impeller, um, then the pump shop won't know to actually put a trimmed impeller back in. Uh, definitely, definitely something to consider, something to keep good records on and make sure you note that when you send the pump off to have rebuilt if it needs one or, or does not. I recently had a utility that um, they actually uh, had a 250 or 300 horse uh, pump and motor assembly that was newly rebuilt and failed to mention that it was a trimmed impeller. Matter of fact, this was one of those knowledge things that it just kind of left the utility based on retirement. So nobody knew. Um, and so uh, when they actually got it back and reinstalled it, um, it, it would not operate. It was uh, um, tripping out uh, parts of the plant and causing lots and lots of issues. Um, the most costly part of that was having to pay a second time for the crane to come out and, and pull that pump and motor assembly a second time. Um, so very, very much so a costly event um, and definitely one that um, highly recommend that we avoid, all right? So um, if we should experience cavitation, which is always a suction side event, um, it's very, very damaging. So the damage caused by cavitation uh, is uh, most commonly called pitting. Um, it's going to sound like rocks inside of your pump or a pinging sound. It's definitely not going to sound happy. This is a real impeller that we pulled and that's exactly what it looked like. Um, this is the wear ring. Okay, so this is the ring that sits around the impeller, right, and sets the clearance between the impeller and the pump case, right? Um, that clearance is very, very important to maintain pump efficiency and it's usually made out of a softer material. Our goal would be to induce the, um, any potential damage into the wear ring, the replaceable part versus the impeller, right? But in this instance with cavitation, uh, there was no, um, no, uh, no going back from it. Now, believe it or not, uh, this impeller's damage, this wear ring's damage, and even this volute case's damage happened in six weeks of, mis of misoperation. This was a newly rebuilt pump and motor. Now, once you cause pitting on your volute case, there are some, some coating processes, but at the end of the day, it's never going to operate the way it, 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 it originally was intended to. So uh, cavitation is definitely something that we need to be highly aware of. Some of the, one of the main causers of it can be something simple as a operational change where maybe you change the water level of, a t of one of your tanks that you're pumping out of um, and you cause it to be too low and you can actually cause cavitation that way as well. So definitely something to be cons uh, consider and to think about. Um, so let's move over to sealing between the wet side and the dry side, okay? Um, and we'll talk a little bit about um, pumping, or pardon me, packing. So these are two different pumps that have packing. Uh, this one happens to be an oil lubricated packing option. Uh, and this is this area that the shaft runs through is known as the stuffing box, right? And then on top, you'll have a packing gland, okay? Um, on the water lubricated style, which is usually more common in our industry, um, there should be a constant drip of water out of the top of that. 
um, that's actually causing a seal. It's carrying off heat, um, keeping out debris, and um, it's uh, also lubricating, right? Um, but it is plausible to utilize a oil seal as well. Um, okay, so let's talk a little bit about couplings because a lot of issues can happen within couplings, okay? If you have a open coupled system here. Um, so the, one of the key takeaways from a knowledge base is uh, there will be a feedback to you as the operator if you have a issue um, within the um, mounting of this, and it, it, it's always expressed as, as vibration. So whenever we discuss a vibration issue in pumps, we're util, usually looking, not always, but many times we're looking at our um, coupling to see if we have an alignment issue. Okay, so the purpose of them is they transfer energy. Uh, some certain couplings can, can, can actually account for misalignment. Um, think of a U-joint, right, um, in a vehicle uh, that may be under the, a vehicle, a drive shaft has a U-joint on the end, and that is specifically made for a uh, misalignment. A few of the other things that these uh, couplers can do is they can allow for end movement, absorb starting torques, uh, can dampen certain vibrations, and another uh, thing that started to become more of a concern is electrical insulation between the two units, right? So as we mentioned before, the advent of utilizing more technology in our industry does have its consequences. If we utilize uh, variable frequency drives, we do have the potential of uh, stray current, right? And that can be induced from the primary of the motor to the secondary and can actually cause arcing and pitting into the bearings. So it can be very damaging. So electrical insulation is another um, potential advantage of them. There are two types of misalignments, uh, angular misalignments and parallel misalignments. So if you have two floating faces, they can be angularly misaligned or in parallel misaligned. And that's another need to know criterion that we like to discuss when we start talking to operators. Uh, one other little um, tidbit that I'll throw in here as we're starting to wind down in, in, in our time together is um, whenever you have one of these that you're taking out of service for rebuild, repair, um, or replacement, note uh, the amount of shims that were used. So under each part of that pump and motor, many times there will be little shims utilized. Um, I once had one of these taken um, out of service and the individual who's performing the maintenance just dropped all the shims on the floor. Um, made for a, a, a big problem because when we went to reinstall it, we had to do an entirely brand new alignment set on it, which took a, a lot of time and a lot of energy. So a, um, a common praxis is to pay very close attention of where location and, and placement of those shims to make sure that they're utilized properly uh, because we really don't want to have a vibration issue uh, in our pump and motor system. All right, well, that kind of is a very high level flyover of some of our pumps and motor systems. Um, I believe we're going till six o'clock, is that correct? Yes, we have a okay. six o'clock. Yeah, okay, so more. we have a couple, we have a couple more minutes here. So I'm gonna sh stop sharing my screen here. And I would like to go ahead and give you guys a chance. You can drop it in the chat or, um, however you'd like, feel free to ask some questions and maybe we can help you out with uh, some of your questions about pumps and motors potentially. Okay, uh, let me thank you, Skylar, for another great presentation. And uh, I'm sure the participants agree that it was a great presentation and a refresher, no doubt, for those preparing for the water operators examination, which will be at the end of this month. Absolutely, yeah? absolutely. So, participants, please go ahead with your questions. Okay, so let's see here. Uh, we have a question in the chat. Um, Ezekiel asks, uh, which of these displacement pumps would be more ideal for pumping chemicals with higher viscosity? So, <sighs> There's uh, sometimes there's a it depends on volume, I would say, as well. Um, 
my personal preference, I'll tell you my preference. I prefer the peristaltic hose style pump. Um, I, I like them because of the ease of maintenance on them. Um, we've used them for polymer, which is about as, as has about the highest viscosity you can get. Um, and I very much so am, am more a little more preferential to the um, peristaltic pile pumps style pumps. Um, obviously, uh, you know, the diaphragm pumps can uh, work just as well in the right application, but I, that's more my personal preference. Um, so I, I personally like the peristaltic style where it's got the rollers and the different tubing that you utilize in them. Same, same type of pump you might if you had a sampler, an auto sampler or whatever. But good question, absolutely. But either one of those pumps can be utilized, uh, even on a larger scale, if you have a uh, thickened sludge that you've utilized chemical thickening on. So uh, water plant residuals, um, if you're using coagulants, can be very, very slippery. Um, and so larger volumes of still that type of a high solids content, um, you know, we tend to see uh, more piston pumps or peristaltic, probably piston is probably, I don't know, piston or per peristaltic is probably more common or um, progressive cavity. I said peristaltic, progressive cavity, pardon me. But yeah, great question. I think volume would matter on, on preference on that, but the hose style pump, the peristaltic pump is a very, very good one for that application. Oh, I see somebody, uh, somebody has uh, some Grunfoss in their picture there. <laughs> okay, anyone, any more questions? You guys are very welcome. I'm gonna drop my email in the chat. If you should have any other questions, um, please feel free to reach out. Um, and we would love to, to help you out. Um, and obviously you have Valerie's contact with Operators Without Borders. That's who I volunteer with. So if you have any questions, uh, obviously you can funnel them through them as well. And we would gladly help you that way as well. Great. Thank you again, Tyler. And thank you everyone for participating. The recording, we will be recording this uh, session and we'll be Thank you. Thanks, guys. Have a great rest of your evening and uh, appreciate everything you guys are doing. Bye-bye. Okay.